The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to the town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The gradual, the psalm, responsorial psalm that that the choir sung there. Psalm 44. It's in your program. If you didn't get one, make sure you can get one in in the back here. Hearken, O daughter, and see, and incline your ear, for the king greatly desires your beauty. All beautiful is the king's daughter as she comes in, robed in cloth of gold. That's a song. That's Old Testament. That's before the Blessed Virgin lived, before our Lord lived, by a thousand years-ish, give or take 200 or something like that. And already it's like it's being woven into the tradition of the, the Jewish tradition, this anticipation of this daughter of God, this daughter of the people, the daughter of Zion who would become, who would come robed in gold. Incline your, for the king greatly desires your beauty. We, we, you know, we are celebrating the feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that at the end of her earthly life, she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. Not like us, when, when we die, our soul goes up and our body stays here. Eventually, what we believe, following the book of Revelation, that there will be a new heavens and a new earth and this separate, this unnatural separation of our body and soul will be ended and will be reunited with our body, but not the body like it is now, but a glorified body as, as Christ had when he rose from the dead. He had a glorified body. That's why he's passing through walls and stuff like that. But since... Well before this time, our Lord was looking forward to this moment when he would come among us. But he didn't just show up. He wanted to be intimately woven into the fabric of humanity. And he didn't just do that randomly. And we know that right here from this this passage. The king's daughter, she comes in robed in cloth of gold, robed in glory. And more of the psalm talks about how this beauty of this this chosen woman, this one that's chosen specially by God, 
uh, for, for her beauty, for her majesty. Now we know that that's the Blessed Virgin. And who else, who else would, he, would the psalm be speaking about? Now, this is intimately t- this feast today is intimately tied with and inseparable from the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, where well, why was she so beautiful? What was it that our Lord, when looking down from heaven, said, her? He didn't just look around to find, okay, let's see how everybody's doing, and we'll find one that's uh, some woman who hasn't had any children yet, and we'll just pick one of the, the, about as good as we can find out there at this time, because it's about time. So we need to find someone. No, 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 no. That's not how God works. That's how people who don't look for, don't look ahead and don't plan ahead work. That's me. The last minute stuff. God had all eternity to be thinking about this. And he wanted a soul with whom he could be so intimately united, so close to, in a way that he was longing for that moment. Just as he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, he wanted to do that again. And not just with one, but all of us, but he needed to start with somebody. He was coming as the new Adam. St. Paul speaks of that. And there's a new Eve, too. The church fathers and early Christian testimony speak about this since the depths of the beginning of Christianity. They were discussing, having topics like this before the church even started to formally celebrate Christmas. It's like that old, we're going back that far. This is ancient tradition. This isn't something that somebody in the year 700 AD decided, you know what, I think personally that No, no, this is coming from the beginning. And it it wasn't without precedent, too, because the apostles themselves, they they watched Jesus go straight up into heaven, body and soul. Also, in the book, uh, from the book of Kings, Elijah does the exact same thing right in front of Elisha. And all the apostles and the early Christians would have known that. And there's a a scene, look it up in the book of Kings, where Elisha is assumed into heaven, his chariot comes and carries him off. And also another individual, Enoch from the Old Testament. Now, he doesn't, the book of Enoch doesn't show up in our scriptures. It's an extra scriptural thing, but in scripture itself, in the Bible, it does speak about Enoch who was ascended into heaven. And so this early tradition wasn't just, didn't come out of nowhere. This was believe from the get-go has been it's something that's been believed consistently for the last 2,000 years but as I was saying it's so intimately tied in with the Immaculate Conception that how can God you, you, could, you wouldn't imagine God becoming incarnate in I don't know something other than someone who he had already through his grace by as a special gift preserved from original sin. That's the church's teaching about the Immaculate Conception, which also dates back to the very first centuries. Eastern church, Western church, both. Now, what would it be like? What, I mean, when we're, right, by the way, this is, this is our, our visual prompt right here. We have the, that's the assumption there, the angels lifting her up, uh, gathered around her, the moon at her feet, the sun behind her, here she's clothed in white and, and blue, but, but in the, the book of Revelation, which we read for the, the, first, the first reading, the way the, the, the previous chapter ends up, and behold, the Ark of the Covenant appeared in heaven, and there's this thunder and lightning, is, and then it goes straight into what was just read now. And a woman appeared, clothed with the sun, and the moon at her feet, I can't remember if it also says the 12 stars around her head. And she was with child. Who gets clothed with the sun? Except by special predilection, special grace, special blessing. 
who is queen in heaven, wrapped with the sun, the moon at her feet. By the way, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, that is exactly what it is. It's a scene from the book of Revelation. Now, all this is, is to Mary's glory, her, this, it's, and, and, and it's something that maybe it's almost, it might feel like it almost kind of like distances her from us, like, oh my gosh, she's just so, uh, like, otherly, and, and how could anyone have even, like, had a conversation with her on earth, because it would have been like, no, no, the sun is, like, it's too much, and it, it, it would be, but that's not how she came across here on earth, we know that. She was there at the wedding of Cana, she was there with the apostles. She would have been helping them. Uh, she would have had a role in, in supporting the apostles in their ministry during our Lord's lifetime. After our Lord's ascension, they're back. He already ascended, and they're back. Where are they? They're, they're back in the, the upper room in, uh, in the, uh, Mount Zion, the one north, so excuse me, it's one upper corner of the city of Jerusalem. And as Luke mentions, and all were to gather, gathered together with, in prayer with Mary, the mother of the Lord. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. You can only imagine she was teaching them how to pray, strengthening them, encouraging them, spending time with them, helping fix their dinner. He was, she was consoling them and Peter, who still wasn't fully recovered from his fall, just, no, Peter, Peter, don't worry. Uh, our Lord loves you. He knows where your heart is. Praying for them, too. She would have been so approachable and so beautiful. It's the innocence of having no sin we, we see it, we, you see it in a baby's face. There's, there's such a purity and such an innocence there. But it's, all, but it's different because it's a baby that has had no experiences of life, no wounds, it's, it hasn't been let down yet, hasn't been damaged or, or corrupted in some way. Mary would have had that kind of face, but having been through life with this immense wisdom that she would have gained from spending 30 years with our Lord. Wisdom and prudence and kindness honed over years through suffering as well. And that would have changed her profoundly. Yet, she wouldn't have lost her innocence in any way. I remember listening to a, a talk by Bishop Fulton Sheen from, it was a recording, and, and I, I don't know exactly when he gave it, if it was here in New York or, or where it was, maybe it was on one of his TV shows, but, but he, he was saying that how sinners kind of complain that, well, you know, the saints, and I'm a sinner, I, I can't relate to them, and they can't really relate to me because I'm a sinner, and I just... Other sinners, they get me, and, and that's who I need to kind of hang out with, and they understand me. Maybe sometimes we feel a little bit like that, like we're feeling, you know what, you, you know, I can hang out with the down here in the gutters of New York. That's a particularly wretched place. But then he, but, uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen went on to say, but... But you have to understand sin. Sin separates us from God. It separates us from other people. It's, it does internal damage. And so actually, the ones who can least understand sinners are other sinners. Because they're, they're messed up and they don't have the heart. They don't have the... They're, 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 they've got, they're, they're not aligned with God. They're... I mean, by the way, we're all sinners, by the way. But then he said, but you know who really understands the sinners are the pure of heart. Because they see the goodness that's inside. They can see that spark. What, they can see in the soul of a sinner the thing that God loves in that soul. And the saint 
can really love somebody else the way God does because they themselves are filled with God's love. So the one who really understands the sinner and knows them and has compassion and empathy for them is the saint. That's, we can just take that and extend it one step further. Well, what about the one who in this earthly life had no sin beside our Lord? That's what the Immaculate Conception was. Our Lady would, would, she would be able to see in every single individual what her son saw, what God the Father saw. And she'd be blowing on that flame, that spark, in order to, to light it, have it, have it burst into something greater, nourishing it, feeding it, protecting it, counseling it, coaching it. And not in some kind of soft way either. Not just we, sometimes we might think that Mary was, was soft. No, no, she, she, wanted, she, she knew that there was little time. And there were so much greater, more wonderful things that the disciples, and now us, could know and experience and have if we open ourselves up to the Lord. So she can be kind of insistent, as a good mother would be. One other thing I wanted to tie together with this is the, the communion of saints. We, we, we speak about that in the creed, in the Apostles' Creed. We, we say that every Sunday. I believe in, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life forever. The communion of saints. What, well, it's this communion that we have with everybody else who is plugged into our Lord through baptism, through grace. There's a communion there. There's a uniting that comes together, even if we don't even know each other. And even if we, and if we do, it gets even stronger still as we pray together, as we worship together. But that communion doesn't stop here on earth. It continues on so that those souls have gone on, have already passed from this life into the next. That communion doesn't get ruptured. That gets stronger because there's even less and less in them that separates them from God and from all of us. Maybe you've had the, the experience of having uh, a loved one who's passed on kind of show up in some mystical, spiritual, blessed way in your life. I've had that. I know some of you have have as well. It's like someone that you is so dear to you that they become present in some way, just and an accompanying. You know they're there. They're, you know they're you experience their love again, their nearness, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It doesn't happen all the time. I think I think God allows that to happen when we most need it. He needs us to stay focused on getting there ourselves. But this communion of saints, of those who have passed on to heaven, also apply, can, extends out to those who we don't know. Other saints we're just getting introduced to. Other individuals that are in heaven praying for us that, that we've never known and won't know till we get there. But when we celebrate the Feast of the Assumption, Mary assumed into heaven this Queen of Heaven, and earth, as one of her titles is. She's our queen. She's present to us. And she wants to be there and show up spiritually, mystically, in our lives too. This were her children just as much as our Lord was. She took that to heart there at the foot of the cross when, when Jesus turned to her and with John standing there and said, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. The churches and the church fathers and Christianity has always looked at that as being more than just Mary and John, the two of them, but as John is a stand in for all the rest of us. That's been understood since, since the beginning of Christianity. That's her being given to us as a gift from our Lord. 
And she wouldn't have said, ha, oh, dang. That's not her response. Her response would have been just to give her heart completely and fully to all of her children. And that's us. So as one who has nothing in her that would separate her from God, nothing in her that would separate her from us, our queen, who's, who doesn't look at, at us as these lowly groveling subjects, she looks at us as her children. Brothers and sisters of her son, our Lord. There's, there's so much depth to this, to this feast, and I don't want to ramble on much, much longer here, but, uh, but I, I just wanted to just in, encourage you all to be open to her to show up. Maybe even ask her just like you might ask somebody else here, hey, would you pray for me? We can do that with her. We can do that with the souls of those of our brothers and sisters who have gone on before us. Hey, would you pray for me? Help me to learn how to love your son the way you did. And we use the words of the Hail Mary prayer from, right from Scripture itself, the Holy Spirit speaking through Elizabeth, who is filled with a, the, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And who am I that the mother of my Lord would come to me? So this feast of ascension, uh, of the ascension, we give, we give glory to God. We thank him for this great gift of a, such a, an amazing mother. And we also, at the same time, turn to our, our lady who is going to where we are all called to be in a way which we will eventually all be there with our own glorified bodies after the new heavens and the new earth appear. Grateful for such an unmerited gift.